Okay, so I'm going to start with um, some questions by Vicki and Jackie and Steve that are around how it's administered. So uh, first question is, does the DREAM-6 study from, from Vicki, does the DREAM-6 study also focus on heavily pretreated patients? So the, the patients there are actually a little bit less heavily pretreated, um, but uh, I think the median prior lines was three. But remember, this is still early, um, so we don't have the final results yet, but it's a little bit less heavily pretreated than, and that's usually what you see when you start combining uh, we tend to kind of move it a little bit earlier in the course. Mm -hmm. That's nice too. Um, Jackie asks, will there be criteria for being able to use BlendRep? Um, like, well, what is the criteria? How many prior lines of therapy? Oh, so I'm not, I knew somebody would ask me that specifically. I believe it is actually approved uh, after four lines of therapy uh, by the FDA. Um, and so, so yes, uh, unfortunately at that point, uh, most people would have failed most of our um, approved uh, medications. Now, so, you know, when, when you start kind of looking at different lines of therapy, um, it, you know, it's not always sort of having to go through four different regimens. Sometimes uh, it's also using sort of four, the, the major classes of drugs. So, um, so but yes, uh, for the most part, uh, you need to sort of kind of have exhausted what's FDA approved before mm -hmm. unwrap. Okay. And then another question around that that uh, Steve has, will using Bellamap prohibit future participation in clinical trials? I would think, I think that's a no, but um, what, do, what do you have to say? No, although I think I saw somebody specifically ask if participating uh, or getting, um, getting BlendRep actually would exclude them from participating in CAR-T trials uh, with BCMA. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually a, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a more well interesting done. question because um, the answer is right now uh, for the current trials, uh, for many of them, the answer is yes. Um, you know, the idea is we don't know why people, you know, when you have a, an antibody or an antibody drug conjugate or a CAR-T or bispecific that's directed against a particular target, we don't know exactly why it stops working. And one of the fears is that perhaps you lose that target. And so none of the new therapies want to sort of kind of take a patient that may have lost that target and put him on their drug, because then now you're selecting for patients who may, it may not work. The good news is that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, most of patients who are relapsing on some of these BCMA-directed uh, therapies uh, continue to express BCMA. So uh, we, I think all of us in the community, and I think Sagar will agree, we have been pushing our uh, develop. Uh, the developers of these drugs to allow patients, uh, or at least a subset, you know, in an arm of the, of the study to allow patients who fail prior BCMA therapies. And I think they're starting to listen. So we are seeing some um, uh, movement there and, and definitely some of the newer uh, uh, CAR T's, for example, or bispecifics that, uh, that uh, will be coming to trials uh, in the near future are allowing patients, uh, to, for, for example, blend rep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Dr. Loniel, yeah, I would like you to comment on these questions too, because um, I, I I think we can cross do this while while we talk about these. Others never heard of blend rep. So <laughs> I don't know if you can. <laughs> uh, so I I completely agree with Jesus. I think we've all been really lobbying to try and get the trials to allow patients with prior BCMA, and I think what many of the trials are doing are creating separate cohorts for patients who have had prior BCMA directed therapy. Um, and now that we have expanded access, we're beginning, and I'm sure Jesus is as well, to start to treat patients that have progressed on either a bispecific or a CAR with belanimaf uh, or belamaf. And, and I think that that will hopefully give us the kind of information we want to know. Uh, as Jesus mentioned, if you look at patients um, who are progressing, particularly on CARs, very few of them are losing expression of BCMA. So I think that gives us the idea that perhaps we can retreat with a different drug, with a different mechanism. We just need to see what that really looks like. And we, we have been very limited in that to date. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, there are gonna be a lot of questions about this, I think. Now, can we talk about the eye toxicity for a minute uh, for this drug? Because it's, um, I think in other cancers, they're familiar with different types of toxicities and there are several questions about different toxicities. Um, so Sheila was asking, how long does it take for the ocular toxicity re to resolve um, if you have this side effect with Blenrap? 
And then Jack said DEX can cause eye issues like glaucomas and things like that. So is there any combined toxicity or do you, are you seeing that at all? Um, yeah, I've heard a lot of questions from patients with, does it resolve? How, does, how long does it take to resolve that kind of thing? Sagar, I think I'm gonna let you take that since you kind of led that study. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so this was actually a big question and discussion at the ODAC that was in July. Um, and uh, for those of you who were unable to tune in, um, it was probably one of the technologically most challenging meetings I've ever been in. Um, yes, so, <laughs> I was in that meeting too. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> didn't, I won't say you didn't you didn't miss a lot, but I think um, uh, you know the there, the the keratopathy, which is the large category of ocular toxicity that occurs with Bellamaf. Um, is a finding that um, an ophthalmologist makes when they look at the cornea. And that has to be done before each dose, as Dr. Berdeja mentioned before, to make sure we understand how significant that keratopathy is. But all patients with keratopathy don't have changes or even symptoms. If you look at this, roughly of the 70% of patients that have keratopathy, 50% of them have some symptom, and the most common symptom is actually dry eyes or itchy eyes. And that's why uh, lubricating eye drops is the first sort of step that we recommend for all patients. If you look at changes in visual acuity, which is the thing that I think we all want to know about because that's impacting your quality of life, only 18 to 20% of patients actually have changes in visual acuity. And so if you look at recovery, and the reason I'm taking this long to answer is, if you look at recovery of keratopathy, the ophthalmologic finding, the average time to complete resolution is about 70 days. But if you look at time to recovery for changes in visual acuity, the average time is 20 days, 22 days. Um, and so that, that really speaks to where we look through the cornea because the middle of the cornea, which is where we tend to get visual acuity changes, uh, that tends to be the last place affected and the first to recover when you mm -hmm. hold the dose or dose reduce. Um, and so I think that's a really important distinction that you may have keratopathy, but that keratopathy may not be associated with changes in your vision. Um, and so you can potentially continue on therapy or hold just for a short period of time. And I'll make one more point, then I'll let Jesus uh, add in as well. And that is when we looked at patients that had to have dose holding or dose reductions in the DREAM2 study, most of them, over 80% of them, either stayed at the same response or deepened their response mm -hmm. during that period of dose hold. So unlike other drugs, and it really speaks to the fact that this is a new target, um, where you're worried if you miss a dose, you're going to lose the response. That happened in a very small number of patients. Most patients were able to continue uh, with their current response or deepen their response while we held the drug. Dr. Berdeja, do you want to weigh in? And also, can you comment um, on the use of potentially steroid eye drops? Because I understand that wasn't helpful, right? Yeah, so, so, you know, as Sagar mentioned, mo most people don't have symptoms um, and, and it's really mostly going to be dry eyes. So it's really lubricating the eye that's important. Uh, but, you know, the, because it, it, it's the steroid drops, we tend to use for things that perhaps are more of an immune effect uh, on the eye and inflammation. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be the case here. So, so that's why those are not helpful. But going back to actually, I mean, I don't have much to add to what Sagar said, because that's, that's great. I mean, and that's, and that's the nice thing about having, you know, the PI here, right? He can give us those granular things that we can't really tease out from, from, from the uh, published data um, and, and all that experience. Uh, but, you know, somebody asked about the steroids, and, and that's true. Unfortunately, that, that, you know, that is something that people are very used to. So we keep talking about how this is a new toxicity, but you're right, it's not. Uh, you know, steroid patients with myeloma have often have to face uh, visual changes, whether it's blurry vision because of the lens getting larger or expanding and contracting and, and cataracts, uh, those are very common side effects of the therapies we have and especially the steroids. Uh, so, but again, these are very different uh, uh, toxicities that should not be additive necessarily. Um, and so I think the important the take home message here is that uh, based you know, on, on what we understand about this particular toxicity is that the majority of patients 
uh, hopefully will be caught before they have any symptoms or any, uh, any change in their quality of life. Uh, and that we can make, and making adjustments appropriately is gonna be, uh, I think, very important. Um, and I think it's very reassuring uh, from what Sagar just said about the patients that were held uh, and, and, and their response uh, were to continue and, and or, or continued uh, and very few people actually progressed. And I think as we come to combination therapies, I think that's actually very important to remember uh, is that just because you may have, uh, let's say you go to the ophthalmologist and you have the beginning of the keratopathy and your doctor wants to stop uh, the uh, blend rep, the other drugs can continue. Uh, and so, and so I think it's, you know, uh, I think it's, it, it's, it, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. I think as we learn more, uh, it's very possible that maybe we don't have to give uh, the blend rep as frequent, perhaps maybe we can decrease that frequency uh, as we start combining it. So, so I think there's a lot of, we have to learn, but I think, uh, I think because it's a new toxicity, I think we'll get excited about it, uh, but I think it's very manageable. And then someone asked them um, how long the infusion was like, um, it's it's administered once every three weeks, right? Is that is that the right? Okay. Correct. And I believe, and it's usually about thirty minutes or longer, obviously, if somebody has a reaction. But yeah. And, and I will add, um, you know, just again to speak to Dex, uh, because um, as all the patients that tell us frequently, steroids are their least favorite drug. Um, yeah. This is actually steroid sparing. Um, you don't have to. You don't give steroids with it. We didn't do that as part of the Dream Two study. Um, and so while okay. yes, you can get corneal <laughs> toxicity from chronic steroid administration, and that may set you up for, um, you know, having more impact on your vision. This, you know, and certainly we, we give a little bit of solumedrol with the first dose, but that's about it. Um, uh, but this doesn't require chronic steroid administration. Okay. Um, Shiva has a question, uh, Risha has a question. And she says, um, with which subgroups of patients will you as experts use blend rep versus CAR-T? Like when will you consider doing that? Will you use it ahead of CAR-T if both are available? Um, and what about patients who have been exposed to blend rep or, or have failed it, then what next? What would your strategy be? I mean, I think that's an excellent question. And actually it's, I'm always, I'm always impressed by the quality of questions that we get uh, in, this, in this format because this, I, I actually was just on the IMWG um, uh, immunotherapy uh, work group uh, meeting yesterday, and this exact question was asked of everybody: How do we, how do we anticipate um, actually using these drugs? Uh, you know, in what sequence? Uh, and the truth is, we nobody knows. Um, but I think there are, you know, obviously, I didn't, we didn't talk about the CAR T in general, but I think in general, most of us uh, agree that the CAR T therapy and perhaps the bispecifics. Um, uh, are, are, are very potent therapies, uh, just a one-time treatment that, that works to really subdue the myeloma um, very strongly. Uh, and I really feel that the antibody drug conjugate is a little more akin to the monoclonal antibodies like Darcelex and perhaps more active because of its different mechanisms of activity, and it will lend itself very well to combination. Uh, but having said that, I, if, if, if a patient meets, you know, it has gone through the standard um, uh, medications and they are uh, uh, eligible for either of a CAR-T or, um, or, or, um, or blend rep, um, it, it really will, comes down to the toxicity. So, you know, CAR-T therapy um, is a potent therapy, uh, but it also has potential significant toxicities. Uh, that can even be lethal. Uh, and so we have to select patients for CAR-T that we feel are strong enough to withstand some of these potential toxicities. It also requires uh, hospitalization, uh, significant uh, uh, burden on caregivers. So it's almost a, a little bit kind of like when you, uh, for those of you who went through a stem cell transplant, sort of that same kind of period of time where sort of kind of everything stops and you have to go through that therapy. Uh, I think in a patient uh, that uh, can do that uh, and is strong enough, I personally, I think I would choose the CAR-T for that patient. Uh, in a patient who wants to, is doing well um, and wants to maintain a, a quality of life, they still are active, uh, uh, they, they, they would prefer to sort of kind of not have that interruption. I think something like Blenrep is, uh, is, 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 is a great uh, treatment option. Uh, e even as a single agent, or in a more frail patient, perhaps uh, would we, you wouldn't want to, uh, or you're worried that they could have significant consequences to a CAR-T. 
Um, but I think it's going to come down to just the individual person and the patient kind of discussing and, and, uh, and making a decision until we have uh, data to the contrary. Um, and it's very possible that we could use, for example, something like Blenrep as a bridging to CAR-T as well. Um, because as you know, or I'm assuming you know, but you know, I guess I can't assume, but with CAR-T, one of the problems is you have to collect your T-cells and then you have to manufacture the CAR-Ts. So there's about a four to six week period of time where you're not being treated for your myeloma. And often patients require a bridging therapy or a combination of treatment to keep your disease under control until the CAR T's are ready. So wouldn't it be nice if we can use something like Blenrep as that bridge to then go to the CAR T? Mm -hmm. Dr. Loniel, do you want to comment on this question too? Because I think it's a big one. Yeah, no, I think, I think Jesus has hit a lot of the important points. The two, from my perspective, that I think are important is that uh, Bellamaf is off the shelf. So you can use it with mm -hmm. a week's notice, uh, presuming you can get into an eye doctor to see them before that whereas the CAR-T does take time. And I, the bridging idea is a really interesting one. It's one I wondered as well, whether you could use it not just as a bridge, but as a way to try and debulk significantly so that you could wait perhaps even a little bit longer with those CAR-T cells in the freezer until you have a better response and then give something on the back end. The second piece that I would argue, uh, or at least throw out there is the DOR, the duration of response data that uh, Dr. Berdeja showed earlier 11 months is almost the same as what we see with CAR T cells. Now, granted, a higher percentage of patients will get to uh, um, uh, a response with a CAR. Uh, but I think what we see here again is that MRD negativity and all those measures that we keep talking about in earlier lines of therapy may not necessarily mean the same thing in refractory myeloma. And um, in terms of potency, yes, more patients are likely to respond to a CAR uh, the bispecifics, it's early to know, really, because we only have 10, 12, 15 patients in these uh, highest cohort patients. But I think that the, in terms of the depth of response and the durability, if you have a response with Bellamaf, your DOR is the same as if you got a CAR T-cell on average. Um, and so I, I don't know that you necessarily lose anything in that situation. Mm -hmm. And this is a different administration than necessarily, like, well, in the CAR-T, you have the cytokine release that you're concerned about, but you don't see any of that with this drug, do you, in Bellamac? Yeah, just no. because of the nature of how it's administered. So, okay, right. and the drug itself. Um, Marianne is asking, with Blenrep, is there a better or worse response that you've seen with light chain only myeloma? With Blenrep or mm -hmm. with what? Yeah. Just in general. No. Um, mm -hmm. No, I don't. I don't think there's any. No, I'm mean, gonna have to ask Sagar, but I don't believe that we know that, uh, and we wouldn't necessarily expect it. What's interesting with uh, light chain uh, uh, myeloma is that the kinetics of the response are different than patients who actually also have a heavy chain, and so the light chain has a much shorter half life. So when you start responding, it drops very quickly, and so you kind of get to a response potentially faster in theory. Uh, or at least you're assigned a response faster. But at the same time, you also come out of response faster, uh, mm -hmm. potentially, because you meet the criteria by the IMWG uh, for progression. So, um, so I think it's just shifted a little bit, uh, and it's more sort of kind of the specifics of, 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 of what we're using as a surrogate marker for, uh, to determine whether you're responding and whether you're progressing. But I don't think uh, that there's a you're better or worse uh, from a standpoint of uh, achieving a response or staying in response. Mm -hmm. Roger, uh, Delonial, have you seen that? Too? Yeah, yeah. So we, we, there were two subset analyses presented at ASCO uh, this year. One was looking at renal insufficiency. And so patients with creatinine clearance down to 30 didn't appear to do any worse than patients with normal creatinine clearance. So renal function does not appear to be an issue. Uh, the second was um, age and risk. Both of those appear to be similar. Uh, the light chain analysis has not been done, as Dr. Berdeja has suggested. And has um, cytogenetics or, high, or, or genetic features, any kind of analysis been done on the Blenrep? Like, does it work better for certain genetic feature patients? Yeah, I mean, again, when you, when you get to six to seven prior lines of therapy, pretty yeah. much everybody is high risk one way yeah. or another. Mm -hmm. um, and so at least in the, in the early analysis that was done, there was no difference in response between those who had a high risk feature versus those who did. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's jump to a, um, a question from Jim about ivernamide. 
and the cell mods in general. It looks to be maybe a great maintenance therapy. Um, can you just speak to that if it has lower level use? And then I kind of want to slip in one of my questions. I know there's a very low percentage of risk with um, secondary cancers with IMITS. Do you, well, maybe you just don't have time to, to have any results on that yet, but do you think that it would be the same as the IMITS or totally different because it's working differently? Uh, well, I'll start and let Jesus uh, add if that's okay. Um, so I think um, what we know, let me do the second one first, and that is uh, second malignancies. <clears throat> it is really the same class of drugs in the sense that it binds Cerebron. It, is, it does have a slightly different target um, in terms of immune versus non-immune. Um, and so in that sense, we would expect it to be similar. There's, it's really early to be able to see that right now yeah. um, in terms of, uh, of differences in, in risk of second primary malignancy. Um, the first question about use and maintenance, there are studies being designed right now looking at IBER as maintenance based on uh, the observation that it appears to be better tolerated than lenalidomide is. And so um, just as we're looking at it in maintenance, there actually is a newly diagnosed cohort that's going to start pretty soon uh, in the 001 trial. Uh, and um, uh, as I referred to earlier, we're actually going to do a trial of either single agent IBER, IBER plus DEX, uh, or IBER plus DEX in smoldering myeloma to try and build on the ECOG trial where we noticed that giving LEN for a longer period of time, uh, the most common reason that patients came off was not progression, but toxicity. And we're hopeful that IBER, because of its better AE profile, may be uh, better tolerated in that setting as well. Mm -hmm. And then how long will it take for the 480 to kind of catch up to where Iberdamide is? I probably months or a year, right? Or, yeah, I, yeah I think you're right. It's, it's roughly six to 12 months behind IBER. Uh, so the first presentation of the data was at ASCO this year. Uh, we now have the dose. Um, and so um, one of the things that we did differently with, with 480 than we've done with any of the IMIDs was explore the dose and schedule. So we've always thought historically 21 on, seven off was the way we give, we give IMIDs. And so we began to explore whether seven on, seven off, 14 on, seven off, all those different schedules were tested with 480. It turns out 21 on, seven off is the right schedule. Um, but because both IBER and 480 are what's called cytotoxic as opposed to cytostatic. And what that means is that um, a lot of what LEN and POM and THAL do is prevent cell division of the myeloma cell. So this, the, the, the mass of cells doesn't grow and then immune effects take in. Uh, drugs like IBER and 480 are actually cytotoxic. They actually directly kill far more potently than thal, len, or palm. And because of that, the schedule may be different, but it turns out 21 on, seven off is the right way to go. And, and I would add though, that I, I think the thing that's impressed me the most about the ibertamide data is the hematotoxicity. So that you know, you're seeing less uh, uh, neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, low platelets, et cetera. So I think, I think that's what's gonna really make it a great drug for combination and in, in early, including obviously smoldering as Sagar just mentioned. So, so I see that drug as being moved a little bit earlier and then maybe 480 kind of uh, being perhaps more potent. It's working in extramedullary disease. It's uh, working at people coming off pomalus, uh, being sort of kind of the one that comes up after that. Um, but again, the, the trials will, will kind of show us further, but yeah, I'm approval, very excited about that. Oh yeah, yeah I, it's super exciting. So, you know, if, um, would you just completely replace, you know, lenalidomide or pomalidomide if, and just use this first and like, I mean, if it's better, it has a lower, lower toxicity and it works more powerfully with bortezomib, then, you know, why, why wouldn't you do that? Yep. I, th yep. That would be my goal is to bring something like Iber up front and then mm -hmm. say, use um, a 480 perhaps as like your palm, your salvage on the mm -hmm. back end. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then the other thing about sort of, again, you know, Iber having that low uh, hematoto or lower hematotoxicity is that you're also going to start seeing some, uh, probably some CAR-T trials, uh, maybe with maintenance incorporation used in Iber, uh, because oftentimes after CAR-T, your blood counts tend to be a little bit on the low side. Uh, and so it is difficult to, to kind of incorporate some of the imits, and maybe Iber will be the optimal one. So, so there are trials uh, being done 
or, or in sort of in, in the startup that are being thought of that hopefully will come, be coming soon. But no, I think, I think you know what, what really excites me about all these new drugs is that I think a lot, one of the questions I get a lot from patients is they're worried about running out of treatments. They're worried that it's like, well, if we're using all these treatments together, because you know, we talk about using triplets and even quadruplets uh, versus sort of kind of saving some for a rainy day kind of thing. Uh, and I think it's, it's reassuring to know that we should always uh, uh, aim for the best treatment possible uh, with what you have. Uh, and, and luckily, uh, by the time you need something else, these newer drugs will be coming through and, and, and maybe even better than what we have. So uh, uh, I, think it's, I think it's an important sort of message to send uh, out there because I, 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 that's how I believe in treatment. I, I don't usually think about sort of kind of reserving something just in case. Yeah, no, I, I would completely agree, um, Jesus. And I think the, 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 the phrase I usually use is like the Doritos commercial crunch all you want, we'll make more, um, because that's sort of our approach. I think centers like, uh, like Sarah Cannon, Sarah's, centers like us, this is what we do, and you'll have access to a lot of this stuff if you're at least in some way peripherally involved with programs like ours. Well, it's so, I, I think it really speaks to also the importance of a myeloma specialist. I, I pound that, beat that drum all the time just because it's, it's so sophisticated now what you have to work with, the tools that you have to work with, both FDA approved therapies and therapies in clinical trials and understanding your treatment options at every stage, whether you're smoldering or newly diagnosed or relapsed, you really need an expert like yourselves on the team. Um, so for patients who don't you know, think they have to get care uh, at an academic center, you can go and, and um, talk to one of these and get a consult every time you're making a treatment decision and then later, you know, go back home and get your infusion at home. So that's really important. Patrick had an interesting question. Would Blenrep be better used as a maintenance therapy instead of like an imid, like POM? So we don't know the answer to that, but um, I think it's, it's an intriguing question. I mean, right now we actually, you know, we're starting to see, uh, trials uh, and hopefully data will be coming uh, soon with the use of the monoclonal antibodies like Darcelex uh, as maintenance therapy. Um, and so the question becomes is, you know, can you replace uh, a Revlimid with, with uh, Darcelex? Uh, do you need to put them together? Uh, those are questions that are unanswered. Uh, unanswered. So um, I think it's a little bit too soon to see, uh, to tell you whether Blenrep will, will serve that purpose. But I think, you know, I alluded that to that a little bit in my questions. Um, you know, I think it will come down to the, our management of toxicity and, and how it's going to be best used. Uh, is this a potent enough drug uh, that you can use for just a limited amount of time and then actually stop? Or is it, uh, and, and, and or the toxicity going to allow us to sort of use it long term? Um, I, I don't think we know the, the answer to that just yet. Uh, but I think, it, it, yes, in theory, I think it would be a potentially very interesting drug to use in maintenance. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, yeah, it's interesting to think about maintenance therapy as a different drug class, right? Because you always think of IMIDs and, and that's been so common for so long. That's kind of what people do. Um, you've ad answered some of these questions. Um, Darlene asked, you know, it's about tolerability for people who have not been able to tolerate pomalidomide or lenalidomide, um, that this ibertamide would be much better. And um, Cindy kind of asked the same question. And then Greg asked a question, does, you know, you, you talked about this as extramedullary myeloma for the 480 that it actually works, but it works equally well, right? Uh, just to clarify that it works equally well for patients who do not have extramedullary myeloma. So do you want to expand on tolerability at all? on some of these questions. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you're absolutely right that uh, the 480 works in the non-extramedullary as it does in the extramedullary. You know, th that was results of a phase one trial. So we really need the larger cohorts of patients to understand the toxicity um, that uh, Dr. Berdeja was describing with Iber. We're a little bit further ahead. Uh, we probably will have data, we hope, in the next year on the expansion cohort of 100 and something patients with triple class refractory myeloma treated with Iberdex. Uh, we don't, we're not quite there yet with 480, but uh, certainly the AE profile um, doesn't look like there's anything new compared to what we usually see with other IMIDs uh, uh, in, the, in that class. 
And it was kind of a, some, so someone asked a question, Linda asked a question about how do you know your cerebron, I'm saying that wrong, cerebron level, sorry. Um, and, and it kind of wasn't known really how these imids used to work, but now you know that that's the mechanism. Do you need to measure your cere cerebron level? Is that something you would even look at to see if it would be effective or not? There was a push a few years ago to try and do that. Um, and I think that Keith Stewart's group out at Mayo in Arizona was beginning to try and look at assays to do that. The real challenge is that um, the, the most commonly used test to assess that, which is called immunohistochemistry, where you take the biopsy and you stain it with a certain stain to see whether you can tell cerebron, was not a very reliable test. Um, and in a number of different hands, it was not a very reliable test. So the the molecular diagnostics to look at cerebellum expression, which is really what you need to know, not just whether or not the gene is there, um, are not as, uh, the testing is not quite where it needs to be. And I think what we've seen is that even with low levels of cerebellum, you can get responses in IBER and 480. And based on that idea, it's not clear necessarily. Like if you have none, then you may get, you may get less of a response. You can have mutated cerebellum in refractory myeloma. That tends to happen somewhat rarely, less than 10% of the time. Uh, but those are such rare events that testing for it right now doesn't make a lot of sense because the tests just aren't that good. But I, I don't know if Jesus has different experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I was just going to correlate that a little bit with BCMA. So, you know, when we first started the, the original CAR-T trials, uh, we required that everybody's bone marrow or myeloma cells to get tested for BCMA expression. And, uh, and, and some of the studies require that you have a certain amount of expression, a uh, certain threshold, because uh, they were worried that if you didn't have enough, it wasn't going to work. Um, and now no trial requires that, because it turns out that um, our ability to sort of kind of measure BCMA is not great, it's getting better, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't, the amount required for positivity uh, is so that we think is low is more than sufficient for the immune system. And so, um, and so really in reality, it's unclear uh, sort of kind of what it means to have higher expression or not. So I don't think there's such a thing as too low expression. Um, I think there are some patients that perhaps uh, may have higher expression or don't lose the BCMA into what we call soluble BCMA that starts circulating that, that may do better. But, but I don't think measuring it per se is necessarily sort of kind of the way to go. Um, because the vast majority of patients will, will respond. And I think it's probably similar with cerebellum, a, a little bit different concept. Okay, okay, well good. One less thing for us to test for, I guess. <laughs> um, so Gloria asked a question. I think she might be, be thinking about um, Bellamaf, but she, she was asking would iberitamide be considered for a patient with macular degeneration? So can you, if, if she meant Blenrep, if a patient already has existing eye issues, um, what would you suggest? No, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. Again, it kind of depends on what issue we're talking about. I think if, if a patient already has issues uh, with their, with their um, cornea, I think uh, that's, you need to be very careful. And that's so, somewhere where you, if you have other options, you might consider others. Uh, but you know, with other things like glaucoma and things like cataracts, they're, they're completely different mechanisms of action. Uh, that I don't think that by itself would ex should exclude you or that you would just kind of shy away from this therapy. Again, uh, it will be very important to be very vocal about any deterioration in vision because obviously when you have competing uh, uh, diagnoses uh, that can affect that, um, uh, it, can, it will significantly impact your quality of life. So, uh, but aside from being vigilant, I don't think uh, glaucoma, for example, would make you ineligible for Bellamy. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you, because this, and they talked about this in the ODAC meeting, that the introduction of um, Blenrap or Bellamaf is now, comes along with a program called REMS. Does someone want to explain what the REMS program is and what you'll be, what you'll need to do, I guess, when you're taking this drug in terms of eye exams and things like that? Just go over it a little more, the REMS program, how it works. 
So the REMS program, um, just in general, so there's several drugs that have a REMS program. So actually even uh, Revlimid, for example, right? And, and, and Pomelis have a REMS program. And that just, uh, and, and, and the CAR-Ts that are FDA approved for lymphomas have a REMS program. So that is just a program by the FDA uh, saying that these drugs have very unique toxicity. So there's something about them that we really need to be very vigilant about. And they design together with sort of the makers of the drug, sort of a system of, of checks and balances in a way, sort of kind of, you need to make sure that this is all in place before you can give this drug. And it also mandates that any physician that is going to actually prescribe these drugs uh, have to be, uh, have to join uh, or uh, sort of sign up for the REMS uh, program. So that if your oncologist does not do so, they actually will not be able to prescribe the drug. Uh, but in the REMS program, it, and, and some are, will be much more detailed than others, uh, it will have very specific things. And for example, for Blenrep, it, had, it mandates that there be a baseline uh, optometry or ophthalmologist uh, visit uh, before starting the drug uh, and then before each, uh, each dose. Uh, so, so that is what, and the REMS can change. Uh, so, you know, the, the, as with time goes by, as we get more data, uh, that can be adjusted. Uh, but that's basically what, uh, what that means. I don't know if Sagar, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I, I think you've, you've hit all the high points. It will not be possible for an oncologist to give the drug without um, input from an ophthalmologist. That is a requirement for the dosing. Um, at our center, we do that. So they tend to see the ophthalmologist in the morning, and then they see us after that visit. We have their report. We look at their grading, and then we look at the chart that tells us whether or not it's safe to dose today or not. Um, that may not be easy for everybody in the community to do. So I think they give you a couple days window. So you can see the ophthalmologist within 72 hours, I think, of when you're supposed to get the dose. And in the beginning, I think you've got a week roughly before the first dose of therapy. Uh, but I think that that is a really important part of the equation. Um, and I'm encouraging oncologists now to find that ophthalmologist who will be able to get patients in quickly um, you know, while you as the office are going through the pre-certification for the drug, try and get them into an ophthalmologist who sort of knows what's coming. And one of the questions that also came up at ODAC was how complicated an exam is this? Do the eye doctors need training? And the answer is a first year op optometrist can find this. This is not a complicated thing. It really is a slit lamp exam. Um, you can see this pretty easily and you can grade it pretty easily as well. So it doesn't require hours and hours of work by the ophthalmologist. It just requires that you have somebody that's willing to partner with you to get that pre-visit done. Mm -hmm. And then over time, as you're on this drug for six or 12 months or whatnot, um, your, your appointments just continue with your ophthalmologist. And, and a follow-up question, um, do you have any ophthalmology type of resources at academic centers or you just go get your, your local doctor? your local eye doctor to do it. How does, how does, how do you navigate that as a patient? I think at least for us, we do use our ophthalmology department at Emory to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if you're, um, if you're a community oncologist, uh, there's usually an ophthalmologist in your hospital or in your group. Um, and uh, they, they would be more than acceptable to be able to do these kinds of analyses. Um, I don't know that it needs to come to an academic center for, for review. Yeah, well, yeah and, and I want to say, Sagar, that I think they're allowing for optometrists to do it, this testing as well. So, um, and, and it, goes, it goes to the idea of trying to make it as easy as possible. So, yes, in theory, uh, if you have an ophthalmologist or an optometrist that you regularly visit, that person could be doing these tests, uh, but it just needs to be really well coordinated with your oncologist. So, uh, I, think, I think what Sagar was trying to say, and I, and I agree with this, is that I think if I'm your oncologist, then I've probably want to work with a handful, one or two different people that do this, get into the practice of doing it and know that these patients are a very quick turnaround and it's required. Uh, because then if you're kind of leaving it to working with a thousand different people, it could get a little more complicated. But, uh, but it's really just a coordination. But, uh, but yes, it can be anybody. Mm -hmm. that, that starts with an O. <laughs> well, OP. <laughs> <laughs> You, you all would know more than me. Um, so Fern had a question and some others had a question about just availability. So um, when it comes to these drugs, so Bellamouth was just FDA approved in the United States. 
how far out is ibertamide or well you kind of said six to 12 months maybe um but is that in terms of fda approval or just use and then how are these used in europe or canada we had some of those types of questions and i guess we could do cross drug right both ibertamide and belamath in answering those questions jesus you want to go first or you want me to go <laughs> I'll, I'll go with uh I mean, I'll just, I'll just tell you what I understand from Bellamath. So as FDA approved means it's here in the United States. Um, I believe it's being looked at uh, by the European sort of equivalent of the FDA uh, as we speak. Uh, and I think they expect it pretty, pretty soon to be approved in Europe. Um, I, I'm not sure where Canada is and Sagar, you may, may know, but you know, some, some, some countries are much more difficult than others, right? So, you know, unfortunately, when we're looking at sort of new drugs coming in, in the U.S., we're a little bit spoiled uh, in that we often get approval and we, we have access to all these different drugs. Uh, but in other countries, um, they're much more rigorous in terms of the data they may require, especially if it's a drug that is sort of a, sort of a new generation. So my, I suspect that Bellomath will have an easier time because it's a unique drug and new mechanism that's not available. Uh, of getting approved in, in somewhere like England, for example, which is notorious for taking a very long time to approve drugs, uh, versus something like ibertamide, where uh, I think they just recently approved Revlimid uh, in, in the last few years. Um, and so they really require very sort of high, what they considered high increase in benefit uh, versus cost uh, to allow a new sort of kind of generation drug to be approved. So I think I think it'll be different for the different drugs, but I don't think we're that close for FDA approval for abertamide, but I may be wrong. Right. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree. I think the EMEA early, uh, the European authorities gave it a very favorable review, which is unusual uh, because typically they required a randomized phase three trial for approval. Uh, but I think the, as as uh, as Jesus mentioned, it's such a novel mechanism and BCMA is an important target. I think that they've already sort of given a green light uh, for that in Europe. Canada, I, I, all bets are off in Canada. I, I can't predict uh, whether or not it will be approved in Canada. Iber and 480 are, are a ways away. So I don't think that it's going to be anytime soon that, uh, that those drugs are going to be out on the market. Um, you know, I think um, Jesus knows these trials uh, in many ways better than I do, but I think we'll, we're more likely to see a car come out first uh, than we would be either Iber or, um, or, or 480. And Dr. Lonia, where are the studies taking place for IBER and 480? Are there any specific locations or are they scattered across the United States? For an yeah, they're, question. they're scattered across the U.S. Uh, and Europe. Uh, so there are European partners for both of these. Um, uh, but um, uh, I don't have the list, but at clinicaltrials.gov, you can see it. Um, it's the MM001 trial is the one that's out right now, but there are a couple of others that are not far away. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the trials that, that Sagar is talking about are, are trials, they're large trials that uh, usually have lots of sites. So hopefully there's a site close to where you live that will have it. Uh, I know, I know, I'm assuming at Emory you have the, some of those trials and the same at Sarah Cannon, we have some of these trials as well. Um, I have a question from Krista, and it's an it, it, it's been asked a lot of times. But what are your thoughts about these new like antibody drug conjugates, the Vites, the CAR T um, cell mods taking place of transplant? Um, I think ever since I think seven ever ever since Sagar and I uh, decided to kind of started talking about this uh, disease called myeloma, there's been that question, what's going to replace transplant? Um, and uh, so I think it's always a good question to ask. Um, you know, I, it, it, as, as we get better, uh, it's always difficult to disprove something. And that's, and, that's, and that's part of the problem. But, you know, we all thought that one sort of the, the revelments of the world and the Kyprolis and the Velcates of the world came together and they were so potent up front uh, we felt that perhaps we didn't need transplant any further. Uh, and so these, you know, randomized trials are occurring. And, and every time you try to disprove transplant, transplant always seems to add something and definitely to a subset of patients. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and what's interesting is transplant is becoming almost like the easiest treatment <laughs> uh, right. just because it's sort of, it, it, it's really just, you know, one dose of chemotherapy, if you think about it. 
Um, and so it's, 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 so I think it's, it be, it's a sort of the onus is on us to prove that we don't need transplant. I think of all the drugs we're talking about though, the, that has the potential, the one that has the potential to, to maybe replace transplant, maybe something like a CAR T. Um, and the, and the reason I say that is just because CAR, you know, the, the idea behind transplant is you're getting this very high dose of chemotherapy that's very good at really sort of suppressing your myeloma to very low levels. Uh, and so CAR T's do the same. I mean, I think one of the things that impresses the most is uh, sort of those bone marrow biopsies within 30 days of the infusion of a CAR T uh, on a patient that, you know, had 80% involvement going down to zero. Um, again, as Sagar mentioned, how long that remains is still in question, but I think it's a very potent, what we call the bulker. Uh, and that's sort of kind of how I see sort of the, the transplant as well. So, so and you know, in lymphoma, they're doing that. They're, they're comparing, uh, pa they're doing randomized trials, comparing patients to getting a transplant versus getting a CAR-T. Um, and, uh, and so I think, I, think, I think we will start seeing some of those uh, uh, trials in, in myeloma. It's just that uh, it's, it's gonna start in populations uh, where we can see answers quickly, like the high-risk population. Uh, and there are actually some trials already ongoing where patients with high risk, for example, uh, are getting their induction treatment and instead of going to transplant, they're, they're getting a CAR-T. Uh, and so I think, you know, when we start seeing sort of those initial signals, uh, that's when we'll start talking about maybe these randomized trials. Mm -hmm. Dr. Loney, do you have any comments? Yeah, I, I think, I think you're, you're right on. And that is, uh, I worry a little bit that it, particularly now with all of this buzz about MRD negativity at cycle four, or MRD negativity at one year, those are great endpoints. And I think that they're important research endpoints, but they are not surrogates yet for long-term outcomes and uh, other than a prognostic marker. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I worry a little bit about is people saying, well, if you get, you know, regimen X and your MRD negativity year, rate at one year is, is 90%, you don't need a transplant. Well, what we know from the Forte trial, which was an Italian trial that had two arms, one was KRD without a transplant and one was KRD with a transplant, that the ability to sustain your MRD negativity was lower in the group that did not have the transplant. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, while achieving MRD negativity is a great endpoint, it is not in and of itself a surrogate for cure. If you can be MRD negative at 10 to the minus six and still relapse, and so I think that the, the transplant continues to deepen many of those responses. And, um, you know, until you have long-term data. So, you know, we, we were very excited about our RVD 1000 paper that came out in JCO just a few months ago, because that has 10 year follow-up almost for some of those patients. We're seeing median expected survival for all patients of 10 to 12 years. And for the standard risk, we haven't even gotten close to the median overall survival yet. Mm -hmm. That's with RVD and risk-adapted maintenance and a transplant. And so I, I would be hesitant to use a one-year endpoint to say you can replace something that I've got 10 years of follow-up on. That, that's right. just the concern I have about those early endpoints. Right. And, and it's such a blessing that the trials are showing such longevity, right? But then that provides a real challenge for you as investigators on these studies. How do you determine, you know, what's better when people are living 10 years and yep. your trial takes forever to, to read out, but it's all good for patients, so. Um, we'd, we'd rather have that situation than the other. Yes, I totally agree. <laughs> it's a great problem to have. Um, so are there any recorded side effects for ibrutamide in the 480? Um, Jumaine asked that question. Any what, sorry? Record just side effects. I mean, you talked about how it's a much lower side effect profile, but are there side effects that are different or the same as the image? Yeah, I mean, I, I can answer some of those if you want. But uh, no, we, we so we still see you know lowering of your white count and your platelet counts, um, just not to the same degree with ibrutamide. Uh, that's what what I meant to say. But unfortunately, you you do still see some uh, uh, the, what we call the cytopenias. Um, there, there is fatigue is still uh, a side effect that, uh, as, you, as anyone who's been on Revlimid or Pomalis knows very well, that unfortunately still uh, is, uh, is the case uh, with these. Um, but I don't, um, I don't think we're seeing the, the rashes that uh, we see with Revlimid. Um, 
And uh, and I think that the you know the you know if you're on Revlimid, sometimes you know you'll get diarrhea and so forth. I think that's also lower uh, with some of these. But Sagar, do you have any anything else? Yeah, no, I think you're right. It's the same profile, the spectrum. Uh, we haven't seen rashes. We haven't seen diarrhea, as you mentioned. Uh, fatigue. Interestingly enough, people that have had uh, sort of tolerance issues with POM or LEN have seemed to do okay with Iber. Um, you know, the CC480 numbers are still too small to really feel comfortable with that. Uh, but I, th that to me is really, really encouraging. There's nothing new that we're seeing with Iber or 480 that we haven't seen with the IMIT. And in fact, it seems to be low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm getting the hook a little bit. <laughs> so I'm going to ask um, one more question about T cell function and go into my time a little bit. Um, Jeff asks, how do you measure T cell activation? Is that T cell count from a blood draw? And is ibertamide going to be less effective in a patient with low levels of T cells or would it increase the T cell count? I kind of want to ask this as a follow-up question too, because I talked to one of the myeloma investigators who said, you know, we think patients might be relapsing on CAR T because you're, you're utilizing these T cells that are pretty exhausted. So um, I think patients may want to know more about how do you measure T cell function? How do you, how do you test? Can I like get ahead of it? And before I'm through six or seven or eight lines of therapy, um, maybe even preserve some T cells so I can, I have some options later. I'll start with the simplistic and sorry, you can come in with the scientific one. Uh, but that's, that's a, I mean, that's, that's a question that we could have a whole seminar about, right? I mean, that's an incredibly complicated question that you're asking. And, uh, and the truth is we don't know. Um, but, but I think the concept, uh, and again, just remember that, you know, T cells, there's many different subsets. There's many different types of cells that kind of work together in unison. It's almost like an orchestra. So, um, so it's really difficult to know, you know, if you measure one in particular, what's happening with the others will also affect. Uh, and it's not just about the numbers, but also about their quality, like we mentioned. So we all believe that, yes, that as you get more and more therapies, as your disease kind of uh, continues to progress through the course that your T cells become exhausted uh, or your immune system becomes exhausted or tolerant to your disease. Uh, and that perhaps if we use uh, cells from early on at the time of diagnosis or even before diagnosis, or for example, a normal donor, for example, uh, that those T cells will be potentially more potent. Um, but we, and, uh, and I think that's what we're, what we're going to be seeing uh, as we move things earlier. So like I mentioned, there are CAR-T trials now looking at collecting your T cells uh, after that initial induction, just when you would collect your stem cells as well, and getting CAR-Ts. It will be interesting to see if those CAR-Ts have a different toxicity profile, or they actually engage the T cells better, or um, uh, lead to better results. And then what's also happening is that now there are what we call allogeneic CAR T's, where you actually have a normal donor that is donating T cells uh, to create CAR T's. Uh, and so that comes with a different sort of kind of uh, set of potential problems. But the theory there being that if your T cells allow your myeloma to develop in the first place, maybe we should be using T cells that, that, that wouldn't have or haven't. Um, and so I think those are questions that will be answered with time. Uh, but yes, no, I think, I think we all agree with the comments that were made about uh, uh, should we be collecting the T cells sooner? I think the answer would be yes. Uh, the question is going to pay for it and who's going to store them. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so T cell function is something that you can measure through flow cytometry, which is a blood test mm -hmm. where you look at the T cell subsets, as was mentioned, and you look for activation markers. And those are things that are sort of predictors of an activated T cell. We, knows, we know what those are and we can measure those. And in fact, one of the things that we're doing here using our immune core is looking at newly diagnosed myeloma, myeloma at the end of cycle four, myeloma after transplant, and then myeloma at a year at peripheral T cell activation and function, just mm -hmm. to see what treatment does to it because we don't really know. It's a little bit of a black box right now. Um, now, the, the challenge with all of this is that uh, myeloma in and of itself is sneaky. And what I mean by that is the myeloma manipulates the environment in the bone marrow so that even if a healthy T cell comes in, it may not be able to get into the area that's packed with myeloma. So Madev Dadapkar from our group has some really nice bone marrow biopsy uh, uh, microscopic images where he shows pockets of myeloma 
and that it's almost like there's a wall around a castle keeping the T cells out. And breaking down that wall is certainly one of the things that we want to do. That microenvironment in the bone marrow actually seems to be able to shield the myeloma cells from immune cells. It's, it's pretty amazing when you look at it, because what that tells us is that myeloma is acting like a solid tumor. It's acting like lung cancer or breast cancer or melanoma, which does the same thing. They wall outside to prevent immune cells from getting in. So one of the challenges with that wall is that um, even if you come in with a healthy T cell, it may not be able to get in, or the cells on the outside of that wall may change that T cell from an activated T cell to an exhausted T cell. Um, and these are, again, all tricky things that myeloma does to keep itself going. Um, and so activating T cells is, is important. And, and in a few patients, and there's anecdotal data, I'm sure Jesus has these patients as well, progressing on CAR T cells, but there's still CAR T cells in the blood, giving them drugs like pembrolizumab, the taking the brakes off the immune system drug that works so well in lung cancer and getting a response again, giving them lenalidomide or pomalidomide and getting a response again. So figuring out how to do all this proactively, prospectively is one of the real challenges. And, and you know, uh, unfortunately, I don't think Jesus and I are going to put ourselves out of business by curing myeloma tomorrow, but <laughs> these are the kinds of questions we're starting to ask as programs to try and move the field forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, amazing. We have so many more questions, and I'm really sorry that we're not going to be able to get to more of them, but we will try to do as much follow-up as we can um, post-show because we have recorded all the questions. Um, and I just want to echo what Scott and Vicky's comments are in the Q&A chat. And Scott says, I, Jenny, I just want to echo your wow, incredible advancements to be made. Many thanks to these doctors and everyone else involved, because what you're doing is truly incredible. And Vicky comments, do you know you guys are rock stars and everything you're saying is music to our ears. And I truly believe you are rock stars <laughs> for all of my Loma patients. We're just so grateful for what you do. Um, I, I'm just thrilled that you're able to join us today. I am going to do a very short, uh, maybe four minute health tree uh, demo, but I do want to thank you uh, before we get to that, just for participating today, spending your time with us and answering all these questions is so helpful for patients to be able to hear from you and see you directly. So I just want to thank you both before I jump into that. Thank you. A pleasure. Okay, I'll, I will just give a really quick, and a lot of you are very familiar with, um, with Health Tree and the idea behind Health Tree. But this is our Health Tree dashboard, and there are a lot of things we can do inside of Health Tree. You can track your myeloma, your labs, and your genetics, and your uh, fitness status, and your full health profile. You can see treatment options like we've been talking about. Um, you can find clinical trials, you can find your genetic twin. And the one thing I want to focus on just for a few minutes today, you can learn with Health Tree University. These doctors have participated with us on Health Tree University. We have over 70 myeloma experts who have um, joined us for over now 650 video clips. So you can learn about myeloma in order and learn all about myeloma genetics and your immune system and things like that that they're talking about. But what I wanna talk about today is also being able to help accelerate myeloma research. And um, you'll see that in accelerating myeloma research, you can participate in surveys um, that are done by myeloma investigators and in studies by myeloma investigators. So right now, for example, we had a lot of surveys and studies in and um, we've, we've kind of completed those and moved on a little bit. But Dr. Hillingas from Waswell Park wants to understand how fitness affects long-term outcomes and how patients feel. Um, so you can answer those survey questions. You can answer survey questions that we're asking but how, about how you navigate a myeloma relapse. And in our studies, they're a little bit longer and deeper. So we ran a over a thousand patient COVID study and you can still join that study if you'd like to do that and answer how COVID is affecting you. But um, this platform has been amazing. Like we have, we have a study that we just 
um, put up there yesterday about do alternative therapies or integrative therapies help in myeloma and are you using them? Like it could be anything from yoga to supplements to, and I would say that's some of the most frequent questions that we get in um, as we do our advocacy, like does fitness help or does my diet help or does, does you know, other, other things um, help? So this is a study from the University of Arizona and we will be doing that. So I just wanted to make everyone aware that that is available. But what I would like to just do is just thank everyone for participating. Um, you as patients are becoming your own best advocate by listening to these types of programs. And the doctors are truly amazing, as you heard. And it's no wonder I say wow all the time, <laughs> even though it might bug Greg. But um, it's incredible the amount of research that's being done. And I just thank all of you for listening in today. I thank Dr. Loniel and Dr. Berdeha for participating. And thank you so much. Thank you.